Well, thank you, Kristen, for the introduction. Uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce some of the recent work we're working on the uh, photoacoustic microscopy, especially for the high speed uh, and the wide field. Uh, let me just uh, go ahead. So uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborators and the students and also the funding agencies, including the CDI uh, grant we recently got. And um, so we have heard uh, quite a bit about fluorescence imaging uh, by uh, Na and Yiya. And uh, uh, for people who do not know photoacoustic imaging, I just want to say a few words about it. Uh, photoacoustic imaging is really 50% the same as fluorescence imaging. Uh, uh, in photoacoustic effect, we actually get photons absorbed by the molecules and the electrons are you know, elevated to the excited state. And when the electronic, uh, electrons go back to the ground state, uh, they do not emit another fluorescent photon. Uh, the energy is converted into heat. So that is a photothermal effect uh, through the non-radiative relaxation. And uh, by you know, converting the optical energy into heat, there is a thermoelastic effect following. And that can convert the thermal energy into um, uh, mechanical energy and the vibration, which is the ultrasound. So photoacoustic effect is basically a energy converter. It converts optical energy to uh, thermal energy to uh, mechanical energy. That is the ultrasound wave. And you can say that we do not rely on uh, fluorescent emission, so which is different uh, between uh, from the fluorescent emission. So uh, anything that can absorb light, uh, fluorescent or not can potentially be imaged by photoacoustic uh, technologies. And uh, this is a, a, a simple process. Uh, for example, we have the uh, you know, ribose cells, which has a lot of uh, hemoglobin that absorbs a lot of light. And we can use the short laser pulse to uh, excite the sample or in vivo. And we have the light absorption and the slight photothermal effect, the temperature increase. And that generates the ultrasound signals, which can be detected by ultrasound transducers uh, around the sample or the uh, animals or the patient. So as you can see, the whole photoacoustic imaging process has two parts. It has optical excitation, which happens at the very beginning, and the ultrasound detection, which is the detection part. So it um, uh, hybrids both the optical absorption contrast, which we think we're, photo we're optical imaging modality, and also the ultrasound the detections, uh, high resolution uh, uh, deep penetration, because ultrasound is much more transparent in biological tissues, as we, uh, we say you know, in ultrasound images in the hospitals a lot. And um, there are different ways to do photoacoustic imaging. And we can do a high resolution version, which is a photoacoustic microscopy. You can go with a micrometer resolution with a you know, millimeter penetration. Or we can go with acoustic resolution only. Um, just forget about optical focusing. We do higher frequency ultrasound the detection. And we can get tensor micrometer resolution with uh, millimeters uh, uh, to centimeter penetration. And what we can just forget about, uh, you know, the, uh, the ballistic photons. We just use diffuse photons and the photons can diffuse as, uh, as much as they want. And the ultrasound is uh, the only uh, part that determines the resolution because the light can be just so diffused that the resolution uh, is solely determined by the ultrasound. It can be up to a few hundred micrometer, but the penetration depths can be determined uh, by ultrasound attenuation that is roughly uh, 10, uh, a few centimeters to uh, 10 centimeters. So you can see that photoacoustic imaging is highly scalable uh, depending on the uh, resolution and penetration depths you want. It can be implemented uh, uh, coordinately uh, to uh, accommodate the different uh, biomedical applications. And today I'm gonna focus on the microscopy part and which is uh, uh, you know, uh, a really uh, one of the major efforts that we're doing in, in, in my lab. Uh, as we know, for all the optical imaging technologies, which use point by point scanning, like two photon, as Na just mentioned, uh, you have to uh, consider a few parameters in order to uh, achieve the desired performance. For example, you have the trade off between the imaging speed and field of view, or the res resolution or field of view. So, uh, how do we actually achieve high speed and high field of view? Uh, that is actually a constant question we're asking for photoacoustic imaging as well. And I'll give you a few examples about the trade-off in photoacoustic microscopy between the field of view and the imaging speed. So this is the one example of the uh, in vivo mouse skin imaging with the vasculature. Uh, so we can see the, the blood vessels with hemoglobin as the, you know, the endogenous contrast very clearly without any background. And uh, the, the field of view is about uh, five by 10 millimeter. It takes about 20 minutes in traditional photoacoustic microscopy to acquire this kind of high resolution imaging with big field of view. And uh, you can surely 
play with the uh, wavelengths of the light. So you can have uh, both, uh, you know, imaging different molecules. In this case, we're imaging the melanin in the melanoma uh, without seeing the blood vessels. And by playing, you know, the optical wavelengths, so you can image different uh, contrast. But every time you image a sync, uh, another contrast, you add the imaging time. So basically that's another 20 minutes of imaging uh, time. And uh, recently we have been working on the brain as well. And you can see, uh, we can look at the mouse brain vasculature with the hemoglobin oxygenation of the blood very clearly. Uh, this is about a eight by 10 millimeter uh, field of view. The image speed is about 30 minutes. So that's very long. And we can combine this with uh, fluorescence imaging of the uh, um, genetically encoded calcium indicator. Uh, this is a near infrared version, and we can look at uh, the both the hemodynamics and the the, uh, the calcium signal at the same time. But this is good for static imaging; just want to give uh, a big field of view and um, high resolution. But if we want to look at the dynamics, for example, the pulse stimulation response by both hemodynamic response and also the calcium response, we cannot do a very big field of view. Actually, we do single point detection because of the limited speed. We have to focus on a single part, single spot, and look at the dynamics of uh, both responses. So, how do we actually achieve a high speed while well, keep the resolution and the speed of view? And uh, in photoacoustic imaging, people can use a uh, transducer array. So, instead of using a single element transducer, we can use ultrasound transducer array with many, many elements, just like CCD in, in optical imaging. Uh, but this is a, uh, okay if it's soft tissue imaging. Uh, it can help us to improve the uh, speed while keep the, res uh, keep the field of view. But uh, for brain imaging, that is a, um, it's not a good option because the skull uh, is a very strong acoustic aberrator. The sound waves does not go through the skull very well uh, because of the aberration of the sound uh, by the bone. So um, we, have do a, we have done a comparison, just a very simple comparison to show you why you know, we think the transducer array is not a good option for uh, this purpose. And we have a hair, which is a point target in this case, and uh, embedded in the skull. And you can see between a single uh, element focus transducer and the transducer array, the single transducer is actually much better in terms of its resolution and the contrast, while the transducer array is much worse in terms of its imaging performance because of the aberration of the skull. Uh, the array doesn't do very well. So how can we actually do this? Well, uh, uh, you know, maintain the contrast and the resolution for photoacoustic microscopy. And we have this new uh, system we developed in the last uh, few years. And uh, in order to do this, we have actually three different parts of the system that has to be high speed. And uh, very briefly, we have to have a high speed excitation as source, which we combine a uh, 532 pulse laser with a Raman shifter and, uh, and uh, a delay line. And we have to have a high speed scanning. So that has give us a wide field high speed scanning with the polygon scanner for this purpose. And we have to do a high speed detection. In this case, we are not using, a, we still use a single, single element detector, but this detector is cylindrically focused. So it can provide a wide field well without sacrifice, sacrificing the sensitivity. Let me see if we can play this video. So this is actually the how the polygon works. It's rotating actually, it's too fast. So we cannot actually see the rotating of the polygon, but you can see the light is scanned back and forth very fast. And we are gonna have this um, ultrasound detector, which is cylindrically focused. And uh, so I wanna talk about this high speed excitation source a bit. This is a Raman shifter based uh, light source and we can achieve about two megahertz laser wrap rate, which is provided by the pump laser source. And uh, by using this Raman shifter, we can change the wavelengths to from 532 nanometer to 545 and 558. We actually just use 558 for the imaging purpose here, but we can have other options as well. And those wavelengths can be used to quantify the oxygenation of the hemoglobin, which is typically done in photoacoustic uh, uh, functional study. And uh, we can, you know, use optical delay line to separate the two laser pulses uh, by a few nano, a few hundred nanosecond. In that case, we are not going to sacrifice the imaging speed by tuning the wavelengths of the light. We can just look, use two wavelengths at the same time and look at the uh, detect the signals simultaneously with a little bit of time delay. 
And this is probably only Joe can understand. We actually can uh, go up to four mag, four mini A lines per second, which is a four megahertz uh, uh, A line rate. A line in photo ghost imaging is the one dimensional signal along the Z direction. So that's basically how fast we can go. Because it's so fast, we have to actually sacrifice the depth range to accommodate that uh, speed. And we quantify the imaging performance. So we have a, a pretty wide field of view, about 10 millimeter scanning range. We can achieve about 10 kilohertz uh, 2D, which is cross-sectional scanning. And uh, uh, sensitivity across the field of view and also resolution is roughly consistent, which is very important because we do not want to sacrifice both uh, sensitivity or uh, resolution across this uh, wide field of view. Otherwise, it's just uh, not going to work for a large uh, uh, field imaging. So I just give you a few examples uh, about what we have done so far and uh, very proof of concept studies. And uh, uh, the first example is uh, imaging the mouse brain hemodynamics under hypoxia challenge, which is typically done in photo imaging just to showcase the, uh, uh, you know, the imaging capacity, right? So I'm gonna show you this video. So at the very beginning, the mouse is, uh, is uh, breathing the normal air with 20% oxygen. But uh, after a while, we feed the animal with 2% oxygen uh, breathing air. So you can see the oxygenation on the right side of the video, it's, uh, it's very clearly shown that the, uh, the brain is hypoxic because the color here means oxygenation, blue color means the hypoxic and the red color is, means the high oxygenation. And this is very clear if you have the functional imaging per, uh, capacity. Uh, if you just look at perfusion on the left, which is just the blood perfusion of vessels, you don't see much change. It's basically the vessel perfusion is the same under hypoxia, but oxygenation is very clearly uh, modulated by the, uh, you know, the hypoxic challenge. And uh, I'm gonna show you the second example, uh, which is about drug. So, uh, you know, we're looking at this uh, uh, epilephrine impact on the mouse brain. Epilephrine is a well used for, uh, you know, for creating the uh, cardiac arrest and it's, it's a life-saving drug. But uh, it's, not, it's not very well studied how this drug can impact the brain, especially the microvasculature of the brain, uh, because we all know that brain is well protected by the autoregulation. So does this drug do anything about the brain? So we do this study with the mouse and uh, we look at how does the microvessels change uh, after the drug injection. As you can see, there is a very clear difference after drug injection. There is a, a very fast vessel, that, uh, vessel constriction, especially the small vessels in the brain. Uh, and uh, more clearly, that's the oxygenation change. The brain has to, you know, uh, the, brain, the brain actually has a very long uh, hypoxic state after the drug uh, administration. And that means the, uh, the brain is actually in the low oxygen state for quite a while, even the microvasculature response is over. So that means even the perfusion is quickly reversed or, re or bounced back to normal state, the oxygenation of the brain is still very low over a large, uh, much longer time. So this is a very uh, strike striking to us because we never thought the brain would respond in such a way uh, with this um, well-used, uh, commonly used drug. All right, this might be a, a new information for people who use this drug for treating the cardiac arrest patients because uh, in clinics, people say that uh, the patient can actually come back uh, because the heart is revived, but the brain never comes back because of the damage. And I wanna go beyond brain. And this is an, an, a new study. Uh, we choose a, a challenging target, which is the placenta. Placenta is a, is a big target uh, in the mouse. Placenta is a big target. And also it's constant and moving because of breathing, because the fetus is moving. So placing is actually quite challenging to image in, in, in photoacoustic technologies. So we use this uh, high speed, high wide field imaging for this purpose. And we monitor this placenta uh, actually uh, development from day seven all the way to day 19. Uh, I don't think I have a day 19, but that's right before the, uh, the delivery. So we can say that the whole placenta is developed over the entire time longitudinal imaging and also non-invasive. So we don't have to do anything. Um, and also, oh, okay, there is invasive. We actually have a window there for the placenta image. And uh, that's for normal placenta. I wanna show you another study, which is for alcohol challenge. So we want to see how does the alcohol change the placenta's response. So we actually used uh, this placenta uh, um, and do a very quick alcohol challenge. We um, 
we look at this oxygenation of the placenta, you can say there is a very clear increase of the oxygenation of the placenta. That means alcohol does increase the perfusion and oxygenation to the placenta. What is the impact? We don't know yet, but that's very interesting to look at. Anyway, so this is a proof of concept that this high speed wide field imaging can be used for this challenging target. And in addition to that, we have a, um, a little bit of study uh, work on the translational uh, 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 for local imaging. So we actually implement this uh, technology for handheld device. And we can look at you know, the lesion or wound on the skin. This might be very useful for uh, dermatology uh, applications. And anyway, in conclusion, uh, photo imaging has evolved so far and it, it is very uh, uh, powerful in terms of uh, um, endogenous imaging of hemodynamics. And we have been working very hard on pushing the imaging speed and the field of view. And uh, we have uh, demonstrated some applications on, on the mouse brain and the placenta. And we're working on the clinical translation for handheld devices. And thank you very much for your time and welcome any questions.